Uh, terrific, Allison. Thanks very much. So um, there's the view from the plant world. And uh, what we want to do now is uh, move on to um, uh, Dr. Nora Basansky from the University of Notre Dame, who's going to talk about her work with, uh, with mosquitoes. So, Nora. Um, I broadened the scope. I'm going to be talking about multicellular animals and as context for understanding mosquitoes. And I'm focusing on more on the evolution side than on the ecological side, uh, because what we really want to know is what is the chance of a transgene introduced into a mosquito population escaping that population or that species and entering into another. Um, okay, so the normal hereditary pattern, of course, is vertical transmission, where uh, parents pass their genes on to offspring within a species. There are two ways in which genes can overcome species boundaries and be exchanged. And the first is called horizontal transfer. This is a process that is much more frequent in bacteria. So it's associated with bacteria and it happens by a number of means, take up uptake of uh, naked DNA, conjugation, so on and so forth. And the public health importance of this was brought home in the late 1950s when it was discovered that antibiotic resistance was being exchanged among pathogenic bacteria. Now, a second means is hybridization that we've heard about before um, with introgression that passes those, the genes in the hybrids back to uh, um, either one or both of the parents. Both of these processes, horizontal transfer and hybridization, were considered rare and unimportant in evolutionary terms for multicellular animals. It's long been accepted that plants hybridize readily, much less so in the case of um, multicellular animals. Um, and in particular, um, horizontal transfer is, is actually rare in multicellular animals as opposed to bacteria. And the reason for that is that in multicellular animals, the germline is sequestered. And that sequestration imposes a, a barrier because, of course, for the gene to escape from one species into another and make it be important evolutionarily, that gene has to integrate not just in any cell, but in a germline cell. So the sequestration is not um, an insurmountable barrier, but it's a barrier enough that it's been estimated by the, this, these authors below that there's one event per 10 to the 10 vertical transmissions, replications, which is obviously is very rare. Um, horizontal transfer usually in multicellular animals has to do with species that are so distantly related they wouldn't even normally hybridize. And that implies that the sequences that are being transferred between species are non-homologous. In addition, the amount of DNA that's transferred in any one of these events is a very small fraction of the genome, and typically it's transposable elements or mitochondrial DNA as opposed to protein coding genes. So this is a very rare process. What tends to promote it, and how does it happen? So one thing that tends to promote it is an ectoparasitic relationship between organisms. And the classic case is the P element in Drosophila. So the P element is a transposable element that invaded Drosophila melanogaster um, in the latter half of the 20th century and within less than 50 years spread in, to all Drosophila populations worldwide. It was known that, it, that this P element came from Drosophila willistoni, a very 
uh, distant Drosophila relative, but it, no one knew how that happened until a mite was discovered, a semi-parasitic mite that co-occurs with these Drosophila species. Um, it feeds on all stages, and the way it feeds is it, it injects its mouth parts and including in, at the end of an egg, let's say, injects its mouth parts and then quickly switches to another host. This is actually the means by which laboratory scientists now using P in the laboratory for various, various engineering purposes do their transfer of P. So uh, presumably that's how P got into, from Willistoni into Melanogaster. But there are newer cases that have been discovered, and this is because in the late 1990s, with the rise of whole genome sequencing, we can, we, we're aware of these events more so than we were in the past. So the, this spectacular case of the triatomin bug vectoring transposable elements to a whole suite of vertebrate hosts. Uh, this is a paper that came out in 2010 in Nature by Gilbert et al. And, uh, just to say that there, there are something on the order of four different transposable element families in common among some of these vertebrate hosts of the triatomin bug. I forgot to say that the triatomin bug, Rodneus prolixus, is a blood feeder, so it, it blood feeds on the host of, uh, on, on a suite of uh, vertebrate hosts. Um, it also carries a trypanosome that is the causal agent of human Chagas disease. So the point is that uh, these transposable elements are occurring in the suite of vertebrate hosts used by the triatomin, and they also occur in the triatomin bug. Um, vertebrates and invertebrates last shared a common ancestor about 500 million years ago. These elements invaded the genomes of the various vertebrate hosts within the last 50 million years or less. So the tr it, this implies that the triatomin bug either directly or indirectly caused the invasion of these vertebrate genomes by transposable elements. Now, um, I said indirectly because although that paper found no evidence of transposable elements in the trypanosome organism, um, uh, an even more likely scenario by which horizontal transfer occurs is host intra- or extracellular parasites. Uh, and, and a classic example would be Wolbachia, which is an intracellular bacteria that invades, uh, that it co-occurs in about at least 20 or 25 percent of different insect species, as well as nematodes. Uh, and it occurs in the reproductive tissues. So there have been numerous cases in which these hosts ha have integrated into their germ lines bits and pieces of the Wolbachia genome. Schistosome parasites have taken up transposable elements, several different kinds of transposable elements from salmonid fishes. Um, trypanosomes that I mentioned earlier have actually acquired, this is one example of a protein coding gene uh, being transferred horizontally. They've acquired a protein coding gene from vertebrates, but have also passed on to vertebrates some, some of their mitochondrial DNA. And in this case, what happened was um, Chagas disease patients infected with these trypanosomes had bits of their mitochondrial DNA integrated into the germline such that this was passed on to the progeny with, I should say, no fitness effects from the mitochondrial DNA. The, the mitochondrial DNA integrated into other transposable elements in the human genome. And finally, there's a bizarre case of uh, a parasitic wasp. It's parasitic on caterpillars with the help of a polydnovirus, it's a long, complicated story, but this polydnovirus carries wasp genes, and the uh, GASME et al. in science published the fact that uh, some caterpillar species have these wasp genes integrated into their germline where they've been recycled and now function to protect the caterpillar against an entirely different virus, a baculovirus. So these are all interesting evolutionary vignettes, but we have to keep in mind that 
this horizontal transfer in multicellular animals as opposed to bacteria is really very rare. It's, so the effect of horizontal transfer has been profound in evolutionary time. Our own organelles, mitochondrial DNA, were transferred laterally after all. And most of our non, well, our genome is mainly non-coding DNA, which is basically the breakdown of multiple instances of invasion of our genomes by transposable elements. And those sequences have been recycled and used for, for various purposes, including gene regulation. But, but the, event, the event of horizontal transfer is sufficiently rare that we would not expect it to be important in a socially relevant time frame. Um, not as rare as, as surfing gen bank might make us think, because one of the practices uh, that NCBI performs on newly assembled genomes is it does a contamination check. So the default is to assume that if a multicellular animal genome wants to be deposited into GenBank, any bacterial sequence is there because of contamination as opposed to it being really integrated. So I think the estimates are going to be lower than the reality. Nonetheless, it doesn't take away from the fact that um, these events are, are very rare, and I use an example here. In Drosophila, it's estimated that there's one event per transposable element family per 20 million years. So this is not a likely worry. Hybridization is a, a, an entirely different situation. So animals hybridize. And on average, 10 percent of species hybridize with at least one other, but it's taxonomically variable. So for example, for some reason, in British ducks, about 75 species, 75 percent of British duck species hybridize with at least one other. At the population level, um, hybridization is rare, roughly 0.1 percent per generation. Uh, but again, the incidence varies taxonomically, geographically, because the species actually have to overlap, and ecologically. And this is really key because even over the course of a year, as rainfall, uh, you go from rainy to dry season, for example, uh, that changes the relative abundance of hybridizing species. And it's a skew in the relative abundance that's a key factor that is going to dictate the rate of hybridization. Uh, Darwin's finches is one case that we know of very well, another being Anopheles. So this is from a paper um, in 1971 in Nature where uh, over the course of time and over the course of the rainy season going, well, actually the rainy season is in April and May, you can see that the ratio of species A to species B uh, shifts such that um, when there's a very high skew is where we see most of the hybrids occurring. Now, um, none of this would matter if the hybrids don't back cross. It, that would be an evolutionary dead end, but that's not the case. So in fact, most hybrids of closely related species are viable, they're fertile, they back cross to either parent, and this, is a, this, this makes them a source, a conduit for gene flow between species. Now, um, we tend to think of species when they arise as being inherently genetically incompatible, and that's clearly not the case. It turns out that isolation is actually enforced by behavior, by mate choice, as opposed to hybrid sterility. That takes a long time to develop. So selection is limiting the genes that have already flowed more so than gene flow itself. And so genetic compatibility between newly formed species declines slowly. And the ballpark figure that's bandied about is five million years. It takes about five million years for newly formed species to become genetically incompatible. The other thing is that back crossing transfers a large fraction of the genome, unlike horizontal transfer. So we're talking huge chunks of chromosomes. And although individually rare, hybrids have a major impact on gene flow, especially in species like mosquitoes, where population sizes are hundreds of thousands, if not millions. <laughs> 
Many cases are known, um, listed here, including our own genomes, carry the trace of hybridization with Neanderthals and Denisovans. But I'll talk about mosquitoes that I know the best. The Anopheles gambi complex is, carries, of course, um, three of the most important malaria vectors in the world, but it contains eight species that radiated very recently, less than two million years ago. All hybrids in any combination are fertile, the females are, um, and there's extensive overlap in species ranges as well as when they overlap, they're um, able to mate at the same time, so the opportunity exists. And in the case of two of the most important vectors in the complex, Arabiensis and Gambi, the hybridization rate is, is fairly high. Um, in the paper that we published earlier, in, earlier this year, we reported massive introgression between these two species, genome-wide with the exception of the X chromosome, but that was historical, and it remained a question to what extent contemporary gene flow is happening. This other group, Wheatman et al. paper, um, looked at this, and they found that hybrids that would normally, by our detection methods, be classified as F1 hybrids, a good fraction of them are actually backcross progeny. So this is important because we know now that it's not just a historical phenomenon, it's continuing until today at this moment. Um, and introgression events are not merely limited to these two Gambian arabiensis. They're found throughout the radiation. Um, and I just want to point out that the, that the risk of gene transfer varies across the genome, and it's less on the X. This is a general pattern. It's not just true of Anopheles gambi. Um, I'll, I'll skip this for time. Um, so the impact of introgression, I would argue, is is significant in a socially relevant time frame um, in newly radiated species, such as the Gambi complex, um, that we see lots of events of introgression, not merely between Gambi and Arabiensis, but other species as well, but not outside. So the nearest known relative to the Gambi complex is a species called Anopheles christii that that shared a common ancestor with the ancestor of the complex about 10 million years ago. We've looked by computational methods and have found no evidence whatsoever of introgression. Anopheles gambi is not a one-off case. There is actually nearly every Anopheles malaria vector exists as part of a species complex. So what's true of Anopheles gambi and what's true of Darwin's finches is going to be true in these cases of new species radiations in Anopheles, in Culex, a vector of West Nile, in 80s species, vectors of dengue and yellow fever. So my take home points, um, the likelihood that horizontal transfer is going to play any role is um, nil. Well, I shouldn't say nil. I don't want to say nil. We can't rule it out. But it's very low. Um, on the other hand, introgression can be expected to play a role in recent radiations. And, um, and in particular, and this came up uh, earlier in earlier talks, uh, it, the risk increases, if you want to think of it as risk, depending upon the persistence of the transgene. And that will vary according to whether, whether the gene drive is aiming for suppression of a population or replacement of a population, or as Austin put it, modification of a population. Um, I say that in mosquitoes this could be a benefit rather than a risk because in this Anopheles gambi complex of these six species shown here, five of them are malaria vectors. So gene flow within the Anopheles gambi complex and the spread of a transgene from gambi to another species may not be particularly worrisome, especially if it doesn't get out of the complex into other mosquitoes or other organisms. So thank you for your attention.